What's up everybody, by popular demand, we are finally updating our what to wire for your smart home video. It has been like three years. Here we go. If you've seen our original video, a lot of things are pretty similar. We're gonna cover a few updates. We're gonna go through the whole list in case this is the first time you've seen it. But right out of the gates, let's talk about Cat6. Cat6 is the wonder wire. When in doubt, use Cat6. Now you're probably gonna ask me if you should use Cat6 or Cat6A or Cat7 or Cat8. Here's the thing I want you to understand. A lot of people think that when we go up Cat6, Cat7, Cat8, that we're increasing the bandwidth. Rather, a way to say it is that instead of being able to push 10 gigs, we're pushing 20 gigs or 40 gigs. The thing to remember with Cat is that as we go from Cat5e to Cat6 to Cat7, what's changing mostly is the distance we can send that signal. So Cat6, we can run the full 10 gigs up to about 150 feet, 130, 150 feet. Cat6a, we can go the full 300 feet, okay? Those are the primary differences. And so we worry a lot less in the home about using Cat6a or Cat7 or Cat8. We almost exclusively use Cat6. I did a post on Instagram recently and a ton of dealers reached out and said, hey, we agree with everything you said except for TVs. A lot of video distribution companies like Crestron, for example, require that you use a shielded cat or a cat 6a for the video distribution. So what those dealers said is they'll run a cat 6a for one of the cat 6 to their TV and then they'll usually run cat 6 for everything else. So that's usually what we recommend for cat. We use cat 6 everywhere and we'll start encouraging that you run one cat 6a to each TV unless you're running conduit or fiber. And that leads me to the next one, fiber. So we'll talk about this in a section later on in the video. But for fiber, we recommend using OM3 multi-mode duplex fiber inside the home. There's different types of fiber. That seems to be adequate to future-proof the home inside the home. You're gonna have the main feed coming from the utility providers to the outside of the home. We do something different from there and we'll talk about it in a minute. So with that in mind, let's get going. What should you wire in your home? This time we're gonna start with kind of the big hitters and work down to smaller hitters. First one on the list is TV. It's the most important thing. It's the one we wanna get right. Okay, we recommend a minimum of three cat six, one RG6, and either a fiber or a conduit. Usually we just run fiber, I'll talk about conduit in a minute. Now, a lot of people hear this and they go, why three cat six? We already talked about one cat six being a cat six A and the other two being just regular cat six. The TV needs hardwired network, preferably. The TV may also need hardwired control that's separate from the network. So we're running network to the TV and then it's getting control via IR or serial. So that requires a second cat six. Then your video feed, if you're doing balance or video distribution, is gonna need a cat six for video. And that's the one you're gonna use the cat six A for. Now, if you have anything else behind that TV, if you're doing things localized like Roku or Xfinity boxes, or you have some kind of a power supply that can be remotely triggered to power cycle, you're gonna want ethernet for each one of those. So it's very possible that you could need five, six, seven cat six behind the TV. We don't normally see that. And we know in advance that we're gonna have products behind the TV, each of which require ethernet. Then we'll run more cat six to the TV. We usually run fiber. I'll come back to fiber in a minute. And then conduit, I'll come back to conduit in a minute, okay? But that's typically what we run at the TVs. Audio, we run speaker wires for audio all throughout the house. And we like to be really aggressive with audio because it's one of those places where when you start getting into your home and you start listening to music, you realize you'd like to have the music everywhere. And it's so cheap, relatively speaking, to put wire in the home for speakers. If you're thinking you might put speakers in that location, go ahead and run a wire there. And there's locations like the shower, the patio, the front patio, the back deck, hallways that people underestimate and later decide that they want to have speakers. So we had a client years ago that's a big party person and he wanted to have friends come over and have a blanket of sound all throughout the house, the foyers, the walkways, everywhere. So that's you, then you can put additional speaker wires. I've had a client recently tell me through the design service that he knew he was only gonna to listen to music in two rooms. He was in his 70s, he'd had a home for years with an audio system. So for him, he only wired up a couple of rooms, that's fine. But if in doubt, put speaker wire in every single room of the house in every area that you think you might listen to audio. Remember, audio doesn't just have to be music. It can be audio books, it can be podcasts, anything that you're listening to on your phone, you can potentially stream to the speakers throughout the house. We usually keep it pretty simple on speakers. We just do 16.4 or a couple of 16.2 for each room. Unless you're doing some kind of hi-fi setup or you've bought some really nice speakers, you've got powerful amplifiers, then we would upgrade the wire to 14.4 or 12.4, or whatever the case requires. But normally we're gonna keep it pretty simple with your audio. Now, a lot of people will have a hi-fi setup. So they'll do regular audio all throughout the house and then they'll have a room like a yoga room or just kind of their zen room. Maybe it's a sitting room off the master 
where they're gonna do a hi-fi setup with some bookshelf or floor standing speakers, some vinyl, uh, some separate amplifiers. And there we would run a little bit different setup of wire. Again, we would look at the application, we would run better gauge wire, maybe you're gonna use AudioQuest, whatever the case is, and put better wire in the room for the hi-fi setup. We get asked a lot about volume control. We rarely, if ever, run volume control anymore. Most of the systems today, you're gonna to run and manage the system from your phone or from a tablet or some keypad on the wall. And a lot of music systems on the market, it voids the warranty when you use a traditional analog volume control. So we can run volume control, we do run volume control, but we see it rarely. Like I would say less than 5% of the projects we do have a volume control. In this mixer, landscape speakers. Landscape speakers wire up a little bit differently. Usually what we do is we run a home run for each zone of audio to an area on the exterior of the home closest to that zone that's not gonna be impeded by something like a, a concrete patio. So when we're ready to finish the landscaping and connect it all the way out to the landscape zone, then there's nothing impeding it. It's easy for us to get to that wire, trench it or bury it. And we usually try and have the landscapers trench it because it's a pain. So try and sync that up. You can give them the burial grade speaker wire and let them trench it for you when they're doing sprinklers and whatever. Get it out to the zone that you're gonna use for your speakers. We're not gonna dive too much into what type of wire to use. We've got a free download and checklist at the end of the video we'll link to as well as our pre-wire ebook and that's going to specify and go way more into the details of exactly what type of wire to use but people ask about landscape speakers you run 116 4 for each zone of landscape speakers so if you have a fire pit that's one zone if you have a pool that's a second zone if you have a sport court that's a third zone you'd run 316 4 to an area at the exterior of the house that you can later connect to for those zones. Next up, surround sounds. You're gonna have primary and secondary surround sounds. Just like it sounds, your primary surround sound is your theater, your media room. You're likely gonna have better, better speakers, better amplifiers. You're usually gonna use a higher grade wire for your speakers, something like 14.2 or 12.2. Your secondary surround sounds, you can, but most of the time with your secondary surround sound, you're gonna use just basic speaker wire. It's gonna be a sound bar, some inexpensive speakers in the ceiling or the in wall, so we're not as concerned about the quality of the wire. We're gonna keep it pretty simple, but you do wanna consider areas in the home where you might want a sound bar, what we consider a secondary surround sound. Game rooms, master bedrooms, great rooms, pools, barbecues, decks, places where you're watching the big game or the movie or the concert and you wanna have better sound in that room than what the TV is gonna to bring to you, that's an area where you would wire secondary surround sound. So sound bars and extra speakers. Next up, we've got your network. We're gonna run wires to your wireless access points, but we also wanna run ethernet to every device that has a permanent location. So Blu-ray players, Apple TVs, uh, desktop computers, of phones, anything that's permanent, it's not gonna move, it's not mobile, we're not gonna pick it up and carry it through the house. We wanna run an ethernet connection to that device, every single one of them, okay? That's gonna maximize the wireless experience for your wireless devices if everything that's permanent is hardwired into the network. So we wanna be really aggressive there with Cat6 and run ethernet to everything that's got a permanent location. Security is a mixed bag. You have people that are like, you have to wire your security and you have people that just wanna go wireless. Number one, make sure you wire your security keypad. Regardless of whether or not you're doing a wireless system or a hardwired system, hardwire your keypads for power. It's gonna save you a headache and it just looks better. If the home's bigger than 3,000 square feet, you need to hardwire your sensors. The wireless systems struggle in sizes bigger than 3,000 square feet. Uh, we went through training with Vivint a year ago and they actually said in the training that when the home starts to get much over 3,000 square feet, they actually start recommending to the client that they use a different company or a different product better suited for homes that size because it's better if they're hardwired. I also recommend if it's a home over 3,000 square feet that you wire for repeaters. For whatever reason, security wiring just doesn't hold up during construction. It gets beat up. Every door that you've wired, if you wire up 10 doors in a house, three or four of them are gonna be broken or mangled and they're not gonna work. You're gonna to have to end up swapping those to wireless contacts. So you do the best you can, you try and wire what you can, but you anticipate there's gonna be some bad wires when you get to the other side. So those wireless repeaters are gonna give you kind of a get out of jail card so you can extend the range and make sure you have good coverage for all the different sensors you're gonna deploy in your home. Next up are cameras. People always ask if they should do analog or IP cameras. Just run Cat6. You have the option to convert it either way. So if it's an analog camera, you can use your Cat6. If it's an IP camera, you can use your Cat6. That's the easy way to do it. You don't have to worry about it. I also like to run two Cat6 to every location. On the off chance a Cat6 gets damaged, it's pretty cheap to run another one. 
but just like speakers, once you fire up your cameras and you start looking at it, clients regularly find that they want more cameras than they wired for. It's so easy to just pull two cameras to every location. That's usually what we do. A rule of thumb is we cover the exterior entrances. So all doors, garages, as well as hazards like a pool, we're gonna cover with a camera. After that, we used to say cover the corners. We don't do that as much anymore because most people don't care about the corners if the key entrances are covered, but there may be a walkway by a fence or between a home where you're particularly concerned. Throw a wire there for a camera. If you need it, you've got the option. Next up are touchscreens and voice control. So this gets back to the idea of Cat6. Anywhere you think you might want a touchscreen, throw up a Cat6 and it can be used for a touchscreen or for voice control from companies like Josh.ai. If you think you might want both in the same room, run a Cat6 for each. You don't have to use it, you don't have to use a touchscreen. Touchscreens can be tabletop mounts, so can the voice control, but if you want it to be in the wall, sort of that architectural design look, then you wanna run a Cat6. Shades is a really interesting one because it's different with every manufacturer. It's one of the few things when we're talking about wiring your home, we can't just pre-wire and future-proof perfectly. Every manufacturer has slightly different requirements for wiring. If you look at Draper as an example, they have some shades that are high voltage. You have to run electrical wire for power, and then you run low voltage for control, or you use wireless to control. And then they have other shades in their line that are exclusively low voltage. So depending on the size, the window, you're gonna have different wire requirements. Lutron, on the other hand, is exclusively low voltage and to make it more challenging, the requirements for Lutron's low voltage shades are different than the requirements for Draper's low voltage shades. So you're best on shades to make a decision before pre-wire of which manufacturer and which shades you're gonna use. Find out from them exactly what the wiring specifications are for every one of the shades you're putting in your package and then wire the home accordingly. But if that's not you, if you don't know for sure you're gonna motorize shades or it might be something that budget doesn't allow until down the road, then what we recommend is one of two things. Use Lutron wire from Ice Cable. So Ice Cable is not Lutron. It's a cable manufacturer out there that makes a wire called Lutron wire specifically for Lutron shades. And you can cheat it and use the shield in the Lutron wire for some other shade companies that have different specifications. They'll frown on that a little bit, but we know that it can be done. If you're not gonna do that, our other recommendation is to run two Cat6 and two 16.2 or a 16.4 to every shade location in the home. So utilities is one of the less sexy parts of pre-wiring your home. We're talking about the internet feed coming into the side of the home, your satellite, if you're in an area where it's satellite internet, but one of the big ones that people forget that you should consider are cell boosters. That's something new to us. We haven't done as often, but we've started doing more of it. Cell boosters use a coax cable that's like on steroids. It's twice the size of an RG6, it's real big. And you run that to an antenna on the outside of the home, and then you have sort of smaller antennas in locations throughout the home. And that helps you boost the cell signal on the inside of the home so you don't have crappy coverage from your cell phone inside the home. Now, if you have a cell phone that does the Wi-Fi calling, it's not as important but it's definitely something to consider if you're in an area that gets poor cell coverage. Lastly, to wrap this all up, let's talk about fiber and conduit. Now fiber, there's different types of fiber and just like cat, the different fibers are used for different lengths and different applications commercially, residentially, but we've standardized on OM3 multi-mode duplex fiber. We use Clearline fiber because it's so simple to use. We don't have to worry about breaking the glass if we pull on it too hard or if we bend it a little bit more than we should. It seems to survive. We don't have to wear the gloves. We're not gonna get the glass splinters like you would with other fiber and it's really easy to, to terminate later. We leave the fiber unterminated unless we know for certain that we're gonna use it. That saves some cost to you until you're ready to use it and then you can pay the expense of terminating it that time. Now you can run fiber anywhere you would put a Cat6. We always run the Cat6 regardless, but the places where we typically run fiber are TVs and wireless access points. We don't run fiber to cameras. We don't usually run fiber to all the ethernet ports, although you could if you want to. The one place where fiber is different is the demarcation. Your service providers are gonna bring a single mode fiber to the outside of the home, and they will not connect the single mode fiber to the inside of the home. And you don't know for sure what type of fiber they're gonna bring until it happens. So we run conduit from the media rack or low voltage panel out to the demarcation. Whatever fiber they bring to the outside of the home, we're able to match it through the conduit, and then we can convert it to whatever we need on the inside of the home. So for the demarcation fiber, we still run the wires we've always recommended, a couple of Cat6, some coax, some 16.4, but we run conduit that's dedicated specifically for the fiber 
so we can match up whatever the internet provider is bringing in. And that brings me to the last one, conduits. So here's the thing about conduit. Conduit's the gold standard for future proofing. Nothing future proofs better than conduit. The caveat is that conduit does go bad. I know people think this is crazy, but you would be surprised how many times we've had a projector and the conduit was crushed and we couldn't pull HDMI or fiber or cat six to the projector. And that's why when we recommend wiring for a projector today, we run cat six and fiber to the projector outside of conduit. And then we run a separate dedicated conduit that we can pull HDMI through later. If for whatever reason the conduit goes bad, we have as a get out of jail card, some cat six and some fiber at that location. We can throw balance on and turn into whatever the latest and greatest HDMI tech is and keep updating it as time goes on. We hope the conduit will be intact, but on a regular basis, it's not. The thing about conduit, if you've ever tried to pull it, it's kind of a pain in the butt. It does go bad. There's actually specifications about how long runs can be versus how many bends and turns there are without adding pull boxes. And part of the reason for that is the longer it gets and the more turns you have, the harder it gets to pull something through that. Even if it's taped off and you've got gel in there and you're trying to make it easy, it, it can be problematic. If you've got 10 TVs and 10 inch and a half conduits plus conduit to everything else, all of a sudden you have a closet and it, it is unmanageable, all the conduit that's in that room. So if you're a person that wants to put conduit in, by all means put conduit in, good for you. What we typically do is we run conduit to the primary TVs or projector in the home. You're gonna have a bunch of TVs that are like kids' bedrooms or the laundry room or the garage where you really don't care all that much. But then you're gonna have your main viewing room where you want the maximum quality you can get, 4K, 8K, HDR, Dolby Vision, all of that. And you want it as good as it can possibly be. That's where we suggest running conduit so you've maximized your option for the future, but still run your fiber and your Cat6, likewise for your projector and your screen. The other place where we like conduit is if you can put some kind of like a plumber pipe as a chase up to the attic or a basement from the rack. So that gives you an ability to get to the attic if you have to pull things from the roof and get back down to the rack. We don't like to use Smurf tube for that. We want something that's more rigid, that's bigger, two inches, three inches, so that we can put a ton of wire through that or a couple of those. Otherwise, we stay pretty clear of conduit. So that's our advice on what to wire for your home. Dealers out there will use different processes. As homeowners, you will use different processes. That's fine. This is kind of where we've standardized and what we've used for hundreds and hundreds of systems. And we've used this for systems all over the country and it's never got us into any kind of trouble. We've always been able to get to the other side of the project, installing and programming everything the client wants using this is kind of our template and guide. And to help you out, we've got a link here below to our free checklist. Full disclosure, when you check on the free checklist, there'll be an offer for the ebook that you can't anywhere else. Some people get upset that we're offering an ebook, so I'm just telling you straight up, there's a free checklist, and when you check out the free checklist, there'll be an offer to buy the ebook. If you don't want the ebook, that's great. Don't get it. Get the free checklist. It's gonna tell you everything that you should run in your house. If you have any questions, you can hit us up online. We'd love to hear comments below on how you wire your home or questions you have to this video. And as always, we appreciate it if you would like, subscribe, and share this with your friends.